All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, you guys can hear me okay? All right. A couple things. Um, for those of you that may not know uh, who I am, my name is Roger Hinchcliffe. Um, I work in the fishing industry, and um, I write for five magazines. I do more seminars on the subject of steelhead than any other angler on planet Earth. Um, I've designed, been involved with over 40 different rod designing projects. With all of that being said, I'm not a professional. Okay? I'm an average Joe Blow, just like you. I put my waders on one foot at a time. And so what I'm about to tell you is, is I can learn from you. You can learn from me. If anybody in this room thinks for one second that they know everything about fishing, I'll look you dead in your eyeball and tell you you're wrong, because you don't. It's a lifelong journey. With that being said, um, you're entitled to your opinion, but you're not entitled to the facts. So when I give you facts, I'm sorry, it's a fact. When I give you an opinion, it's an opinion. Take it for what it's worth. But my job here today is to overload your brain about the subject of steelhead. And I can assure you, if you've never been to my seminar, you better strap in, because this is not boring. We're gonna go, I'm gonna throw a lot of information at you. All right? If you have tomatoes and you want to throw them at me, now is the time to exit. <laughs> All right, so the first thing we're gonna talk about is the biology of the steelhead. I start with this on a lot of my different presentations. I have over 14 different presentations on the subject of steelhead. I can spend an hour on barometric pressure, right? So the first thing we're going to talk about is the biology of the fish. Most people don't know, I'm glad you're all sitting down, a steelhead can go 12 months without eating. Let that sink in for a moment. In the Great Lakes, it's six months. Typically our fish come in in the fall and they stay until the spring and then they go back out to the lake. Right? And then there's always people that go, well, that guy, there is no way that that's possible. Well, I'm sorry, that's a fact. And this is how they do it. When you see the steelhead come into the river, they're nice, beautiful, shiny chrome. And then after they've been in the river a while, they get smooth like bullets. And a lot of people think that their scales just fell off. No. Their bodies absorb them for nutrition. They live off their fat reserves. A manistee strain steelhead typically has a 4% fat factor, right? Um, out west in, in northwest Indiana and in southwest Michigan, we have the Scamania strain. They have a fat, uh, fat factor above 8%. That's why the landing ratio of those fish is one out of three. So it's their fat factor and water temperature that dictates how hard they fight, right? So what I'm trying to tell you is that still had to have two different metabolisms. There's a high metabolism fish and there's a slow metabolism fish. The fish that you are catching are willful biters and those are high metabolism fish. What people don't understand is fish have memory spans. I'm sorry, that's fact. A lot of people just don't wanna believe all this stuff. It's a stupid fish. Well, you, you're entitled to your opinion but you ain't entitled to the facts. Now, why I'm explaining that to you is, you're home to the world's largest steelhead population on planet Earth. In the Great Lakes region, as a whole total, we stock 5.2 million fish, okay? On top of that, you're also home to the world's largest angling community for steelhead. So I hate to tell you this, but no, I don't need to convince you. You live in Pennsylvania, I have fished here. Anyone ever been to the Manchester Hole? I have actually took photos of that to show friends because that's, that's a lot of people, right? So what happens is when you catch that high metabolism fish, two things occur. You either meat locker it up and put it in the cooler or you let it go. So you just took the willful biter out of the equation. If you released it, you just educated that willful biter. Now, the good news about high metabolism fish is you can catch that fish, release it, and turn around and catch it five minutes later. Some fish, some high metabolism fish might not bite for another 30 days, okay? Now, a slow metabolism fish has the longest memory span, 
And if you catch that fish and release it, it might not bite for 90 days. Roger, why are you telling me all this amazing information? In case you haven't put it together, every time you catch that fish and release it, you just educated it. And those are the willful biters. So if they get pulled out of the stream or you educated it as the season wears on, it gets harder and harder to catch these fish. That's why you need a high water event to bring you fresh fish that haven't been educated yet. Does all that make sense? Now, for those of you who think that I'm just like, this is, can't be true, yes it is. They've taken rainbow trout, they put them in a uh, tank with a black bar. The fish learned if I nudge the black bar, food pellets will come out and they'll get fed, okay? Then they took these same fish, took them out of the tank, put them in another tank for three months, no black bar, they hand fed them. Three months later, they took those same fish and they put them in the tank with the black bar. What do you think happened? They fed themselves. So I'm sorry if you have a hard time believing that fish have memory spans, but they do. It's documented fact, okay? So why that's important to you is I'm gonna teach you a few things about how to catch these fish, right? in hopes that you'll be better at catching them, all right? So we'll go ahead and move on. What length rod? This is a good one to talk about. Again, folks, I try to throw a lot of information. I can't cover it all. I got 50 minutes an hour or whatever they're going to give me here. Now, one of the things is, at a minimum, I would tell you um, a 10 and a half foot rod. Now, I know you have small streams here. So for you guys, because I go all over the country giving these seminars, right? So I would tell you a nine foot six at a minimum, right? But what you need to understand is your fishing rod is a tool. Your fishing rod is a tool. And if you notice, like I designed this rod for your fishery. This is an 11 foot three red line, four to eight. You can see it's a, it's a noodle, right? This is what's called the center spin. You can use this uh, with a center pin reel or a spinning reel. But what I wanna show you is the length of this rod. Now, what happens is, if you ever read my article, uh, I'm going to start, and I'm going to pass this around here. There you go. You got it? Okay. We're going to have show and tell. Aren't you excited? Um, so, anyways, what happens is, if you've read my article, Fishing is Mathematics. If you've ever delved into some of the information that I've written about, fishing is a mathematical equation. Right? So the more water you can cover, the more fish you can catch. The longer you can get that drift, the more fish you can catch. It's common sense. So what a lot of people do is they, now I understand we're in Pennsylvania and you, it can get crowded on the streams, but you, if you have some water to yourself, right? Fishing's about angles and we'll talk about that. If you get the right angle, you're gonna catch more fish, period, in a discussion. But what happens is, with that longer rod, I can pick the line up and set it behind the float. We call that mending, mending the line. Does anyone not understand what mending means? It's okay, we're here to teach you. Okay, so what happens is the line, because it floats high in the water column, it's gonna get ahead of the float and create a giant loop, right? And what happens is the fish are sitting in the current, right? And they're seeing things come by them all day long. And there's a thing called current speed. They know how fast something should come by them. Well, if you've got that big loop of line and it catches the current, it'll start pulling your float or your offering or your fly or whatever too fast, right? So when you're fishing for overfished fish, we're trying to trick that fish into biting, right? So with that longer rod, you can easily pick the line up and set it behind the float. But more importantly, I'm going to be able to cover more water, right, because I can get a longer drift and pick that line up off that water quickly and set the hook. Does all that make sense? Are we still friends so far? Okay. Because, I mean, there is people that fish with a seven-foot rod on the stream, and I'm not saying you can't catch fish. Absolutely you can, but a longer rod is your friend. And not only that, at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is control your offering and your float. So the longer rod helps you with all that, right? Okay, 
That was the first rod project I designed. The closer, that's the one we have up for grabs. That's a 13 foot, four to eight pound stick. It's domestically made and it retails for $5.99. If you didn't put your name in there, make sure you do so. Also, Fish USA is doing 20% off all lime glass rods. And that's just showing it loaded up. That's the X11, which is uh, a very reasonable priced rod. All right, so we're gonna talk about this. Most people don't understand how many pounds of pressure are at the hook. Anyone wanna take a guess? You can't answer if you've been to my seminar before. Anyone wanna take a stab at it? Two pounds? One to two pounds. That's the number. That's it. On average, it's a pound and a half. I know, you're like, are you kidding me? Now you understand how people can go tuna fishing with this like super light leader and land the fish, right? So, and, if, and there's always one person. There ain't no way there's only two pounds of pressure at that hook. That guy is just full of it. There's no way. Well, I want you to go home and I want you to tie a big loop and I want you to take your little digital fish scale and I want you to pull as hard as you can and have your wife tell you what it says. Yes, it's one and a half pounds on average. It doesn't matter what you're running. Not all lines are created equal. Um, you know, this is being videotaped, so I gotta watch some of the things I say. Um, but if you followed my career, you've known that I've tested every fishing line known to man at a laboratory. And uh, I know quite a bit about fishing lines, right? And some of them I do not fish for. I'm not on the payroll, I don't get free product. I've tested them and they're good lines, right? So we're gonna talk about that. So floating braid, this is called P-line hydro float. How many people here fish a spinning reel? Okay, so if you've never still had float fish before, this is a great line. I don't fish for P-line. This is a braid, right? It's a high floating braid, high visible braid. And what's good about this uh, line is it rides so high in the water column, you can mend it really easy. And because it's braid, you can set the hook with less stretch, right? And so this is a good one. Now, this one has some drawbacks. The issue I have with this line is in the winter time when your guides on your rod start to ice up, it will peel the coating off that line. So you just wanna make sure you keep your guides clear if you're gonna try that one. Uh, here's another good one, Suffix Siege, Suffix Pro Mix. This is my favorite line, Gamma. How many people here have ever tried Gamma? Okay, if you've never tried Gamma, today is the day we're gonna cross over and we're gonna try Gamma. Let me tell you why I like Gamma. Gamma is a cold polymer mono and it floats extremely high in the water column. And why that's important to you is once we get into winter months, and you're fishing low, clear water, overfished fish that have been educated, right? It becomes a game of inches, right? So if you're having to mend your line and do these big mends and disturb your presentation, right? You don't want to do that. And uh, here, we'll go pass that around. So anyways, does anyone know what makes mono float? Okay. On the inside of the line, there's little air pockets. That's what causes mono to float. For those of you people that are taking notes or just wanted to know, it doesn't matter if it's a mono, if it's fluorocarbon, uh, braid, whatever, all lines are gonna absorb moisture between 15 and 35%. And that's gonna be dependent on the type of line, the material, the ambient conditions, temperature, et cetera, okay? And, um, I might as well just pass this around. How many people have ever used mucilin? Wow. Today is the day, folks. Listen to me. I don't fish for this company. They've never sent me a free nothing. I don't get a 10% discount. I don't get nothing for this. You, there's an applicator pad in here. We're going to pass that around. Mucilin? So there's an applicator pad, and you're going to put that six feet on your main line above your float. And it's good for four to six hours, right? So you just rub that and coat your line six feet above your float. So what happens is when you go to mend, you don't disturb your presentation. 
Now listen, you don't have to tell your buddy that you listen to Roger Hinchcliffe. Just try it. You're welcome. I promise you, it's a game changer. Because I just told you a fact. 15 to 35% moisture gets absorbed into that line eventually. And what does it do? It slows the presentation down. Current speed is key. Sometimes I feel like a preacher. Okay, Siglon F, another good one. Uh, not all leader materials are created equal. Um, for those of you that didn't know, there's only four factories on planet Earth that even manufacture fluorocarbon. There's only 10 stiffnesses that you can even get to fluorocarbon, right? The best fluorocarbons actually come from Japan, right? The, the Japanese have got line making down to a science. It's awesome. So does anybody know the finest fluorocarbon on planet Earth? Okay. V-hard, V is in Victor, hard, V-hard fluorocarbon. Drennan is V-hard fluorocarbon. So if you buy V-hard, it's $26 for a 55 meter spool. You can get this 50 meter spool for, I don't know, is it 15 bucks, 16 bucks, somewhere in there. So the only thing about Drennan is it's rated two pounds under its actual breaking strength. So if you buy eight pound, it's really 10 pound. If you bought six pound, it's really eight pound. Does everybody understand? You're so welcome. Now, line diameter equals bites. This is what kills me. I've been fishing your streams for years. Well, Roger, I can't get bit if I only use six pound test. That's the only way. I gotta go down to four pound. I can only go down to four pound. That's the only way I'm gonna get bit. I'm not saying that you're incorrect, but you're all wrapped up about the pound test. What you need to pay attention to is line diameter, right? Line diameter equals bites. So here's a good product by Cortland, love it. But this is the line, folks. I'm the guy that made this line famous in the world of salmon and steelhead. The bass guys have been using this for years. Now you go, now Roger, that's a $25 spool of line. Well, hold the fort. That's 200 yards. It's a bargain. But here's what's so beautiful. Roger, I can only fish six pound liter. And I, that fish broke off. Did you know you can get 10 pound and it's six pound liter? Why would you ever fish six pound liter again? I'm just asking for a friend, right? If you want to catch fish and stop breaking them off, you can actually fish this line and actually catch more fish. Just try it. That is a bargain. Uh, knots. How many people tie an improved clinch knot? Fisherman's knot. Okay. Today is the day. All together now, we're going to join hands. We're going to cross over. And you are never going to tie that knot again. I'm very sorry. Follow the bouncing ball. Here's the eye of the hook. The line is tied right here. I'm fighting the fish, and the line is moving all over the eye of the hook. What's happening? We're creating friction. What happens when we get friction with a hard, dense material like fluorocarbon that heats up faster than any other line? Line failure. But more importantly, follow the bouncing ball Pretend that I am your trophy steelhead and I'm hooked in the side of the mouth and you're fighting me and you got that improved clinch knot. What's happening? You just lost leverage. You know, a steelhead is the fastest freshwater fish on planet Earth. They can move 26 feet a second. Okay? If you've ever been out west and caught a 20 pound ocean run live wild steelhead, you, let me tell you something. It's exhilarating, especially if they got sea lice on them. I'll never forget when the guide told me to sit down or you're going to die. So I sat down and he's trying to row and I'm in this stream with a 40 gram float. You know what I mean? It's exhilarating. So anyways, you got to tie the right knot and this is the knot that you need to tie. You want to snell your knot, right? So you don't lose leverage. This is if you're fishing a spawn bag or a bead. Spawn bag and a bead. Double uni knot for joining two knots together is my favorite. 
the Albright Special. And then here's where we're going to mess with your professionalism. This is what really kills me. So, for, first of all, when I talk to the young people and I ask them about yarn, they look at me. They're like, yarn? You're going to knit me a sweater? No. We have been using yarn to catch fish for a very long time. Well, what's yarn look like? <laughs> they, I mean, they don't fish yarn, right? But here's the thing. Guys are so, and gals, sorry. People are so hung up, and when I tell them this, that, well, that doesn't look right. I don't care if it looks right. Just get the net and land this fish that I just hooked again because you refuse to set your rig up like this because it doesn't look right. What happens is, in the egg loop knot, we got this loop. And in Michigan, for king salmon, we run skein underneath there, if you've ever salmon fished in the Salmon River with skein. You do that, right? Out west, they do that. But when I steelhead fish with a bead, I'll put a piece of yarn there. How many people ice fish? How many people fish for panfish? I love them perch deep fried. Those are good. Don't forget the peanut oil. But here's the thing. When you talk to a really good pan fisherman, they go, now, Roger, the reason why you're not getting bit is you're, cover you're, you're not covering your hook point. Oh, God. What? Yes. For some strange reason, somewhere in the world, it was written that a steelhead angler cannot cover his hook point. Hmm. Get the net. So what I do is on my bead, you know, I have my bead, you know, up here. I'll put a piece of yarn there. There's plenty of fly guys here. You ever seen a milking veiled egg? Of course. So what happens is that piece of yarn covers the hook, adds profile size to the bait. For those of you that are taking notes, color, size, profile, depth, color, size, profile, depth. Master those things, you will become a river ninja. So what happens is you're going to change the profile of your bait, you're going to add contrast to the bead, and more importantly, it's a scent wagon. Just give it a try. And I got a YouTube video on it on my Steelhead Manifesto YouTube. You can check it out. And there you go. All right, so now we're going to talk about our hook eye penetration. Uh, this slide uh, we got from In Fisherman. And so when you look, see what happens? See the, the line direction and the shank direction? That's not what you want. This one requires more force, but that's where you want to go. All right, light and heavy hooks know what's best for you. Now, if you've never read um, my article, Why a Small Hook Wins, that was one of the most famous articles I've written. It was published even over in Europe. Um, the, there's a book that I do have a chapter in that we'll sh I'll show you here in a little bit. I did a lot of research about hooks because I'm one of these people, you know, most people go home at night and you sleep. I can't sleep. I got a problem. I can't turn it off. I keep thinking, why does it work this way? What can I do different? Right? So anyways, um, my favorite hook is the Raven Specimen Wide Gap. Right? This is one of my favorite hooks. Now, wide gap is where you want to be. Right? Wide gap hooks. And you guys have them in stock, right? You got them here? Yeah. Fantastic hook. Got a micro barb on it. Um, I prefer an offset of six to nine degrees. Um, you know, when we get to the bead part, I'm going to give you some information that was worth the drive over here if you fish beads. Because most people, the landing ratio for beads is one out of three. Today, if you listen to what I'm going to teach you, you're going to land two out of three. All right, Gamagatsu micro wide gap hooks. I love this hook. I don't know, do you guys stock these? I don't know if you do, but they're a great hook. Got to have it. All right. Now, the C14S by Gamagatsu, here's the thing. This has been a standard glow bug hook. And for your fly fishermen, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I've got to tell you this. But you might want to change the hook you're using. And the reason why, you see, when you hook the fish and you're fighting the fish, you bore a hole in the fish's mouth. And the bigger 
that hook is, right? You, the bigger the hole is. Well, what happens if the hole gets too big? You lose the fish. Now, if you're one of these people that like to get back to the, to the car and people say, well, how'd you do today? Well, I went one for 10. How about we do better than that? You spend all this money for your license, your waiters, your gear. Let's land some more fish, right? Let's use the right stuff. So I put this in here. Does that not hammer home the point? Right? Light wire hooks are for you. I've already taught you there's only a pound and a half of pressure at the hook, right? And yeah, see this is tacked in the top of the mouth. That's a number 10 hook, okay? All right, what float and shot pattern should I use? Now, this is something that uh, is very important, all right? And before I get into the floats and all that kind of stuff, one of the things that you need to do as an angler is sometimes you need to walk up to the hole and sit down. Just chill out for a minute. It's okay. The steelhead police are not going to come arrest you. The next thing you want to do is look at your surroundings. Look at the hole. My favorite is when people don't even stop and they just walk right into the stream and they step right on top of the steelhead. Oh boy, right? Stop and chill out a minute. The steelhead might give their location away. But the other thing that I want you to get in the habit of doing is studying what you have going on. And one of the things you need to pay attention to is when you're float fishing and you got your bobber going down, if you see leaves going uh, faster than your thing, that means you're fishing too slow. But if your bobber goes way past those leaves or a piece of foam, right, you're fishing it too fast. You need to get the right current speed. So you have to write, uh, use the right float for the application. Now, when I have fished out here, the average float size for me personally was four to eight grams. I don't know, depending on what river you go to. I mean, you know, we fish 40 gram floats out west. So you want to get the right gram float. Now, you slip floats in deeper water when long casting range is required. Slip floats are a better choice as they're much easier to cast and help with line twists. And why that is, if you ever watched a slow motion video of when you cast, your line is helicoptering. But if you have the slip float that slides up and down the line, you can just spin it on your line, right? I personally like a fixed float. And if you listen to the podcast that I did on salmon trout steelheader, um, I talk about fall rate. Nobody talks about fall rate. Only the bass guys do. But for some reason, steelhead anglers don't care about fall rate. Eh, I'm sorry, you should. You're fishing for overfished fish that have been educated. And so the 22-pound fish that I haven't put up here that I caught this year was on a black rubber worm. I'd already went and made the cast a couple times, and I knew there was a leviathan toad that had to exist there because it was perfect. It was the wolf's lair. I said, I'm going to try one more thing. I cast it out. I stopped the spool and let that black rubber worm jig rise up in the water column. Then I let it go. And on the fall, fish on. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. I about had an altar call right on the stream. If I hadn't have done that, I would have never caught that fish all week. Right? That was the only trophy fish that I got for the whole week. So fixed floats are easier to stall the float, right, because of the stem. Does that make sense what I'm saying? You know, you got, it's, it's you know, mechanics. You follow me? The stem of the float? That's why I like fixed floats the best. Select a float with the right diameter and carrying capacity of the shot for the water conditions. That's why you need to pay attention to how fast, even if you're fly fishing, right? You drift, you want to pay attention to how fast your offering's going through there. Sometimes you need to slow your roll through the hole. I'm a rapper and didn't even know it. All right, so our friends at uh, Raven, Here's some of my favorite floats, the fast and deep. We're going to pick on this float right here. You see that right there, that white line? That's called the water cocking line. The water cocking line. It's very important that you add enough split shot, right, enough weight to get to that white line. Then the float becomes neutral buoyant, and it's less pressure to pull it under, right? 
Does that make sense? It's called a water cocking line. So it's very important you add enough shot. And for those of you, um, well, we're going to get into shot patterns here. This is a standard shot pattern. This slides from our friends at Raven. The standard shot pattern setup has all the shots equally spaced. Now, this is a very important slide. And I'm so happy Raven created it because there's a couple things. Number one, see the bottom current? See the surface current? The bottom current is the slow current. Now, um, again, this, uh, some people say this is an opinion, but it's a fact. If you've actually studied, you know, I've had all these conversations with biologists all over the country. Steelhead are eight inches off the bottom or less, period. The only time they're not eight inches off the bottom or less is during the drop back phase, okay? That's where they're at, is on the bottom. Why are they on the bottom? Because it's slower there, right? Now, the reason why they're there is because some of these fish do not feed the entire time they're in there, right? That's how they make it. They live off their fat reserves, their scales, and conserve energy, right? They conserve energy. Everything about a steelhead is controlled by what's called thyroxin levels. And there's very uh, lots of things that can, you know, affect their hormonal levels, including water flow and barometric pressure. So anyways, if you look, this is sliding out. So what happens is your float is here, your weights are here, and then your fly, your spawn, your bead, everything is way out here in front of the fish instead of them seeing all this business, right? So that's why this can work. And for those, and this one starts with larger shot and you get smaller. If you go, Roger, I don't want to do all that. Buy yourself some water gremlin three ot split shot three slash zero, right? Watch my YouTube video on how you dye split shot and you make them black. It was your streams that I came up with dyeing the split shot. I came out this years ago. Now all, all kinds of people do it. You're welcome. But I noticed in my streams the fish were so pressured they'd see that shiny split shot and move out of the way. But what's beautiful about the water gremlin 3 ot is you pinch them on with your thumb and index finger. Thumb and index finger. Don't be pulling out your hemostats and clamping on them. There's a guy in New York that teaches that. Okay. That's called damaging the integrity of your line. Put them on, and now you can slide them up and down and change your shot pattern and adjust things, right? But the purpose of all this is to get the bait, the fly, the bead, whatever, way out in front. Because you're fishing for overfished fish. This is a slip float uh, bulk shot pattern. See, this is really deep. Your average river is 48 feet deep. That's it, right? There are some rivers that have really deep holes in them, like obviously the Niagara. But your average stream, it, you know, it's two to four feet deep, no more than eight feet deep, right? But this is what's beautiful about this. Micro split shot on your leader. For those of you that are taking notes and you're on your phone, you better put that on there. Every time, put a micro split shot on your leader. The reason why you're going to do that, it's going to get you to the zone. The zone. The fish are on the bottom. Especially when you get into the wintertime. you got to get in their face with it. Right? So... All right, accelerated shot pattern, which happens in the spring when you're fishing the faster runs. It's the reverse of the tapered. You're basically spacing the shot, and you decrease them as they go down the line. How good can a fish smell? Oh, boy, this is one of my favorite subjects here. This is, this is where, well, that Roger, he's a walking commercial. Well, I'm sorry if you want to be in denial, but let me give you the facts. Fish can smell in parts per billion. Let that sink in for a minute. Parts per billion. But Roger, I can't wrap my brain around how good that is. That's a thousand times better than my German short-haired pointer bird dog. Let that sink in. Now here's my favorite. I can nail people down and say, well, do you think fish use their nose to navigate? Well, yeah. Do you think fish use their nose to avoid danger? Oh, yeah. Do you think fish use their nose to find food? Yeah. But mysteriously, when they get into the river, they no longer use their nose. 
Is there anyone that would literally believe or want to argue this with me that that's true? Thank God nobody is dumb enough to say that because that is not true. They use their nose. That's like a white-tailed deer. Oh, well, when I get to the alfalfa field, I'm, I'm not going to use my nose anymore. They absolutely use their nose. Now, what happens is when you touch a bait, you touch a bead, you touch a fly, you deposit L. sarin. They can smell that. So some of those photos through my career, you'll see me with nitro gloves on. And you know what? I get made fun of. Don't care. When you've caught as many big fish as I have, then we'll talk. They can smell. So Canadian scientists in 1987 took a homopathic solution of human skin cells and put them in a river with migrating salmon. What did the salmon do? They stopped. Then they took bear pelts and put them in the river. What did the salmon do? They stopped. Now, did they say, that's Roger Hinchcliffe and he's gonna eat me? Or did they say, that's Yogi Bear and he's gonna eat me? No, they're genetically programmed to understand whatever that is, is danger. So do yourself a favor and consider using scent. Just saying, Procure is my favorite. Uh, if you're going to nail me down on one of my favorites, I would have to tell you Steelhead Combo. Steelhead Combo, they have it out on the showroom. Now, one thing is a very overlooked with Steelhead people, salmon people not so much, but Steelhead people, is garlic. Steelhead, oh man, garlic, that pungent smell. All right, so what they see. So when you look here, murky water, look, color red is the first one to fall off the color spectrum. Right? And in the clear water, you see, right about that depth, I don't know, what is it, seven feet or whatever it is, it, things start to change, right? So what you see up here is not what the fish are seeing down below. Now, how many people have listened to the podcast I did, Steelhead Don't Wear Sunglasses? Nice. For those of you who didn't listen to that, I highly recommend you listen to it. That podcast messed everyone up. Mess their brains completely up. They're like, my God, he is teaching us something completely different than what anyone else has ever said. So let me help you out. So when you're driving in your car, I'm sorry I'm picking on you because you're like right in the front row, but please, I'm not picking on you. You're driving in your car because you got sunglasses on and you're driving in direct sunlight. Can you see? You got to do two things. You're going to either have to pull the visor down, or you're going to have to put your sunglasses on. Anyone ever caught a steelhead with sunglasses? Thank God. Oh, oh you have. You got a photo of that? <laughs> so if I hand you a ping pong ball or a golf ball and you hold it up, you can't see it. If I hand you a basketball, you can see it. See, the problem is my favorite myth among steelhead anglers is, well, Roger, if it hadn't been a bright, sunshiny day, I would have caught more steelhead. It needed to be overcast. No, you were using the wrong profile size. That's why I've told you color, size, profile, depth. Color, size, profile, depth. Write that down. Get that in your memory span. Right? It does it not make sense? See, steelhead are used to 40 feet, cold, dark, deep water. Mother Nature sent them up into that stream where it's really shallow, and they're blinded by the light. Why does the color chartreuse and pink work so well? Okay, I'll tell you. It's called water ripple. Water ripple. Wind ripple. When the sun hits that, the beams of light are going all over the place. See, those colors have a natural UV characteristics to it. UV is your friend. Man, I, I, this is wonderful. I can see the brain just a working out there. I mean, does that not make sense what I'm saying? So on a bright, sunshiny day, consider using a bigger bait, fly, bag, bead, right? That was my favorite about the beads. Like, so I'm the guy that brought the green bead to the Great Lakes. I was made fun of. Are you crazy? Green? No, they ain't going to hit that green. No, everyone has got a green bead now. It works. 
color, size, profile, depth. Okay? It wasn't until I made the analogy with the bright sun with the profile size that it finally kicked in. So now people in the Great Lakes are actually fishing 14 millimeter beads instead of a six millimeter. And I'm not saying six millimeter beads don't work because they absolutely do, right? But you got to use it for the right application. So we're going to talk about baits, color size. We kind of touched on that. If you'll notice there, there's black, black spawn netting. How many people use black? Two. Highly recommend you consider different colors. How many people will hook their spawn bag like that? Oh, I know. We can't cover our hook for overfished fish because it doesn't matter. Okay, get the net. All right, so here's another thing. Leaves in the water. So what happens is the steelhead is in the stream. And what's coming by them right now? Orange, red yellow all day long orange yellow red all day long right that's all they're seeing right now leaves in the water cause tannic so if i gave you a clear glass of hot water and gave you a tea bag and you started dunking the tea bag what happens to the water changes color leaves in the water change the color Here's the color you need to use, and that's the color blue. Leaves in the water, blue bags. Now you know why in Ohio and Pennsylvania, the color blue works so well. Now there's always that one person. I'll never forget it. I'm in Novi, Michigan at the ultimate fishing show because there's those people out there that know everything about fishing. Like that Roger don't know nothing. I know everything. He says, well, I ain't never seen no blue egg. And then I hit the slide and the entire crowd roared. Now, if you've ever watched my video on YouTube about the stages of the egg bite, yeah, I'm the guy that's been writing and talking about that for years. You're welcome. It really is a thing. We're just not trying to sell you more colors for more money. There really is a thing. Like, I didn't make that photo up. All right, so here's colors of some dead eggs and floaters for contrast. Now, again, fish are genetically programmed to hit round things. They're genetically programmed to hit round things. Eyeballs are round. Eggs are round. Do yourself a favor. Part of your biggest problem with steelhead is helping them see your bait. That's why people catch more steelhead on an overcast day because they're not blinded by the sunlight. But instead of putting that together, everyone says, well, it was because it was a bright, sunshiny day. No, you're fishing the wrong profile size. You're welcome. So what this does is it gives them a bullseye. Help the fish help you get to the net. Okay, single eggs are really, really good. Um, you know, like you can buy the muriatic acid eggs. I've cured those eggs up. Those work great. Um, you know, you want to do that outside. But you can go, Roger, I don't want to mess with all that. Well, here is a solution and tip for you. When you cut your spawn bag netting, save the scraps. Because you can tie a single egg up. Try a single salmon egg. Oh, you're welcome. You want the address for the Christmas card? You want to talk about, that's dirty good right there. All right, my favorite bead company is Great Lakes uh, Steelhead Company. I love their beads. Last time I knew they had like 160 something different colors. What bead size, color size profile, we talked about that. You want to match the bead size to the mood of the fish based on water temp. Match the hatch based on spawning fish and time of the year. Water clarity and again, sunlight. When you have a sunshiny day, fish a larger profile, okay? All right, and then you want to match the bead size and hook size. So the bead needs to go in the gap of the hook. It needs to fit in the gap of the hook. Everyone got it? Okay, now here's where I'm going to mess with a lot of people. There's another guy in New York. He tells you, well, you got to use an upturned eye for beads. Okay, now you know why you lose all your fish. Who wants to argue that with me? 
Do you think that that's not crowding the gap of the hook? Straight shank hook, right? And make sure the line is going in the right direction. Because what happens is that bead slides down as you're fighting them, crowds the gap of the hook, acts as leverage, and pops the, the hook out of the fish. You're so welcome. And for those of you that don't want to admit that, my God, this guy is brilliant, that nobody's ever told me that, it's okay. Just do it. You're welcome. All right, here's another slide of that, okay? Stop using the upturned eye hooks. Okay, my favorite soft beads, BNR, soft beads. Uh, this is a bead fish I caught in the Manistee. That's a big fish. I'm just saying. What else we got? What happened here? Okay, very overlooked. Now, there's one of the things that I like about uh, Pennsylvania and Ohio. My friends here get the concept about night crawlers. Now, when you go back home to Michigan, night crawlers? Well, you can't use no night crawlers to catch a fish. Well, I got a really simple question for everyone out there in the audience. Have you known any fish on planet Earth that won't eat a night crawler? Well, for some reason, still had people think that they don't work. Not out here. I know you guys get it, and I appreciate that. Uh, here's the other one, shrimp. Shrimp is a great bait for steelhead. You know, they eat freshwater shrimp, right, out in the Great Lakes. But I know, I know, once they pass the concrete barrier or the walls or their pier heads and they go into the river, there's a memo, there's a sign that says, you cannot no longer eat shrimp in the river. Is there anybody that believes that? You're welcome. So when you say, Roger, I ain't got no spawn bags, we'll go get you some shrimp and rail out. Works great. And this is where I hook them, right here, right in the center. And I use, you know, small ones and larger ones and different things. And oh, by the way, well, Roger, when I run my shrimp, I take the tail off. How many big fish do you know that have no tail? I'm asking for a friend. I think we're, you guys are picking up what I'm laying down. All right, here's another tidbit of information. If you didn't know it, steelhead like it head on. Head on. When they attack prey, when they are feeding, they want it head on. Get it down there. You should lose 12 rigs a day. I'm sorry. It's true. If you ain't losing 12 rigs a day, you ain't fishing deep enough and you ain't in the zone. Get it in the zone. That's where the fish are. Now, I do. I mean, there's uh, one guy who tried to take me on and said, well, steelhead don't feed up. Oh, okay. Well, let's just say for the sake of argument that you agree with me that we have hatchery fish. Yep. And you're saying that they don't feed up in the Great Lakes, which is totally dumb because you know they do. They go out and feed on bait fish. I said, so you're talking about hatchery fish, right? They go, yep. Okay, so when they take the dog pellets and spread them out on the surface, what happens? They come up and eat them. And oh, by the way, anyone ever heard of anise? You know, some people have said, now, Roger, why does anise work so well? Well, if you ever studied the composition of what's in the dog pellets, there's anise in there. You're welcome. Moving on, water temperature below 45 degrees, that's the number. Once you get to 45 degrees, a steelhead does not want to move great distances to catch a fish, right, or catch a bait. That's the number, 45 degrees. Everyone thinks, well, it's got to be around 33. Once we get to 33, they're not going to move very far. No, I'm sorry, it starts at 45. I've already given you the facts that they don't eat for all that time, and that's how they do it, is to conserve energy. It's all Mother Nature's way. So what I do is I break out the jigs. Everyone ever heard of voodoo jigs? Voodoo for the win. That Tom Andrews has got a great product. Highly recommend it. Now, one of the things that you want to do is tie the right knot for a jig. If you've been on my YouTube channel, you'll see how to cock the jig. So there's two knots, either the Palomar knot or the Trilene knot. And what happens is it causes your jig to ride like this. And then the next question, we'll just keep moving right here. Well, Roger, how far do you fish that jig off the bottom? Well, that's easy. 10 to 12 inches. That's the number. Because they're already 8 inches off the bottom. And they're sitting there and it's in the wintertime. And, oh, that looks good. They just rise up 2 inches 
and suck that jig in. Fish on. Now, can you catch a fish when the jig is riding like this? Yeah. But you're going to catch more if it's like this. Is, how many people ever walleye fished vertical jigging? If you ain't vertical, man, you ain't catching fish. Try what I'm telling you. You're actually going to catch more fish. So just tie the right knot and help yourself. Is that coming off an indicator too? Yeah, for sure. All right, so here's another thing. Sometimes plain is better. Well, Roger, it doesn't have that pretty white or pink or chartreuse or whatever. I'm sorry. I've already taught you that you're fishing for overfished fish. How many jigs do you think them steelhead have seen? Trust me on this. Try a plain leadhead jig and put you a wax worm on there or a different offering on there, a piece of shrimp, uh, whatever. It works great. How many people dye their wax worms? What? Oh, man, I'm getting a Christmas card now. I know I'm getting a Christmas card. So if you ice fish and you don't dye your wax worms, this is like dirty good, stupid, evil good. The caddis green is dumb what that does to steelhead. And it's called Crazy Dust with a K. Crazy Dust with a K, it's made by a company called Bobber Down. They're out of Saline, Michigan. I have sold them thousands and thousands and thousands of bottles of this powder, and they won't even give me one for free. They won't even give me 20% off. And if Fish USA starts to carry that, hopefully they'll make a call and say, hey man, you better take care of that Roger Hench clip and send that boy a free bottle of that stuff. But what's beautiful is you take your wax worms, you sprinkle the magic dust on there, it's the magic dust. And then 24 hours later, you're gonna get up to go steelhead fishing and you got a nice green caddis. And do not discount the color yellow for steelhead, yellow. You're fishing for rainbow trout, man. Yellow, brother. Yellow, yellow is a good one. Butterworms. Now, in the wintertime, you have a question? Yellow. Oh, jello. I've never tried jello. I don't know if it kills them. The crazy dust doesn't kill them, it just dyes them. Their bodies absorb it. Well, you could try jello. I'm going to try it. Why not? Put some in a Ziploc bag and see what happens. But like in the wintertime when you're fishing low, clear water, but you got a bright, sunshiny day, use a butter worm, larger profile. You're welcome. Dirty good. Wigglers, you guys know about wigglers. Oh, here's another one. Berkeley Gulp Helgramites. Anyone ever use these on a jig? Yeah, not too many. I'm very sorry. You need to try these. Now, word of advice. This is the most important information I have shared with you all night long. Whatever you do, for the love of God, do not spill this in your car. You will be divorced, and you will never sell the car. Okay? That was a joke, just in case, if you wanted to laugh. I'm just trying to make it fun here, folks. Rubber worms. Uh, okay, so this is my favorite worm company called WFO, right? Now, Fish USA is stocking these worms. Now, one of the things I want to teach you about this worm is... If you pull one of these worms out of the package and hold it between your thumb and index finger, and you just hold your arm like this, all of a sudden you're going to see this thing just come alive. I don't know what kind of compound they make those worms out of, but they are the most soft, jiggly worms known to man. And the other thing, which is a trade secret, nobody has the iridescence that those worms have. And for those of you taking notes, iridescence is your friend, right? If you follow me through the years, I'm a big guy on iridescence. Um, okay, rubber worm fish, that's a big, do you think that's a big steelhead? Okay. Berkeley gulp minnows, I don't have to tell you guys what's beautiful about my friends in PA. You guys get it, but in Michigan, what? You're going you gonna to float fish with that? I'm like, yeah, man, get the net. Here's the other one. Real minnows. You fish with real minnows? I'm like, yeah, they do it in Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York all the time and catch a lot of fish. But in Michigan, Wisconsin, Indiana, nope. Isn't that weird? It's, it's kind of weird. I'm just saying. How many people know a fish that won't eat a minnow? Or a worm. Exactly. So you guys get it. Uh, that was an 18-pound hen. All right, you're supposed to laugh again. Tell us where the fish are hiding. I have Kermit the Frog locked up with Legos. 
Okay, maybe you can laugh tomorrow or something. I don't know. Uh, okay, here's the thing. 80% of the fish are caught from home. Let that sink in for a moment. 80% of the fish are caught from home. Now, today, or yesterday, I wanted to fish. And I didn't go fishing because I asked Nolan about a lot of questions. I knew before I even got here that fishing wasn't going to be very good. Now, I understand that you work. We all work. And when you got a chance to go, go. But if you had a choice of Saturday versus Sunday or maybe Sunday over Saturday, do your homework. And these are the things you want to know. Water temp of the river. Not all flow gauges that tell you how fast the river's flowing give you the temp. Right? So you need to rely on a buddy or a guide to give you that intel. Or if you live near the stream, just walk down there and take a temperature reading yourself. You can buy a thermometer for 10 bucks, right? Uh, water flow, fishing reports, weather, and barometric pressure, right? These are all things you want to know. Where to find steelhead. Google Maps is your friend. Is there anyone in this room that does not have a smartphone? Okay, you need to get one, sir. Matter of fact, we might save up some money here today and take a donation and get you one for Christmas. You need one too. Yes, sir. All right, you give me your son or daughter's email. I'm going to send them an email and say, get this guy a smartphone. Now, what's beautiful about this is we go, well, Roger, I've never fished that river before. Well, why don't you look at Google Maps? Before you even get there, you can start dropping pins. Do you think the steelhead are going to be right there? No, right? So do your homework. Wherever there's bridges, there's fish. Wherever there's boat launch, there's fish. I'm trying to help you find fish, right? Our friends from uh, In Fisherman, look, how still I position according to water level, low, high, very high flood stage. If you learn all this stuff, you can do your homework at home, and you're going to know right where the fish are going to be setting, right? And, oh, there's a rubber worm fish. Pink rubber worm. Suggested reading. The Bead Bible. I have a chapter in this book, and then they took a lot of my research about hooks and put that in the book as well. It's called The Bead Bible, and that's uh, by Randy Bonner, and that's available through Amato Publications. Uh, what Fish See? This book is no longer in print. I've never met this man, but you can still get it used. If you're a troller and you haven't read this book, I'm sorry. Uh, this guy, Ronald Reinhold, he is from Michigan. This book is like 350 pages long. It's a horrible read. You're going to have to read it for like three times. But I got to tell you, that dude's brilliant. Smart dude. Um, this book, uh, John Nagy, he's from this area. I've never met John. If you know John, tell him I said hello, even though I've never met him. And I've promoted his book. And the reason why I promote his book, it's on fly fishing, is because he's the only one that gives the runoff rates of Steelhead Alley, period. You can't find it online. He's the only, he was smart enough not to put that out there. It's only available in his book. And then uh, Great Lakes Angler Magazine is one of the magazines I write for. And Salmon Trout Steelheader, and that's a big steelhead, I'm just saying, right? Tips and tricks. Does your rod ever look like this? This is my buddy's fishing rod, and he refuses to clean it because it's gonna wash off the juju. I understand about juju, but dude, I like to be clean, like I like to shower, brush my teeth, I just like everything to be clean, crisp and clean. Dollar store is your frame, goo gone, right? Dollar 25, citrus base, so if you salmon fish, or you got skein juice and cure and all that stuff all over your gear, this will wipe it right off. Um, freeze your own spawn bags. Now, what happened is uh, when I come out here to uh, Pennsylvania, when I used to, because I haven't been out here in a couple years, on average, I'm glad you're sitting down, I would go through 300 spawn bags. Me and my buddy would go through 300 bags. That's how many fish we catch when we come out here, right? We catch 100 a day. Your fishing here is amazing. What happens is when you freeze them, they get shriveled up. So you can buy any of the liquid brine cures, put your bags in there, and overnight they'll plop right back up. Okay? So that'll save you some time, finish the product. Uh, when I used to guide, here's a spawn time board. You can make one of these to help you tie up bags quicker. 
Um, Pips Leader Carrier. I don't fish for this company. I'm not under payroll. But again, if you read my, um, uh, I've done a, a seminar on it too. Again, fishing is mathematics. So I have already told you that you should lose about 12 rigs a day if you're fishing correctly and in the zone. Well, what that means is you're going to have to retie. Now, I, I wear glasses. I am getting older. I just turned 27. <laughs> now, that got a laugh out of people. Uh, so what I'm saying is if it takes you 20 minutes to retie, right, and you're supposed to lose 12 rigs a day, do the math. Fishing is mathematics. The more time you're in the water, the more fish you catch. So you can pre-tie your leaders, twist that thing all up, and stick it right in your pocket. So when you break off, you just pull that out, pull a leader out, tie it on, and start fishing again. Fishing is mathematics. Now, if you fish bead rigs, the fishing leaderboards are fantastic, especially if it's legal, you can fish double bead rigs. Can you fish double bead rigs here with two beads? Does anybody know? Okay. Yeah, so this would be a great way to tie those rigs up ahead of time. Uh, and then if you can't afford the five or six bucks, you can get a pool noodle at the dollar store. Okay? Now, always bleed your fish. If you're going to keep a fish, right, and smoke it or eat it, or you're keeping the fish to eat it and for eggs, blood is your enemy. Blood is your enemy. So what you want to do is just pop a gill or cut a gill and let the fish bleed out. You're going to have way better tasting fish, and then your eggs aren't going to have as much blood in them when it comes time for curing. And then if you catch a fish and they're bleeding from the gill, you have a carbonated beverage, pour the beverage down their gill plate, and what will do, it will cauterize the artery, and you will save the fish's life. Yep, Mountain Dew, Coke, maybe your Pepsi. I don't know. And then uh, that's another big steelhead, I'm just saying. And questions and answers, nobody threw nothing at me so far. Anybody got any questions, ideas, concerns? Yes, sir. Just on controlling the flow, you're holding that back. Well, yeah, so um, what you want to do is, it depends, right? It depends on the situation. But what you're talking about is what's called float trotting, where you're trotting your float and you hold back on it. And the reason why that works very well in catching steelhead when it comes to a presentation is two reasons. Number one, you automatically slow your roll, slow it down a little bit, but by doing that, it's causing everything to swing out ahead of time, right? So we didn't get into it, but one of the things is, here's the problem with people. Like you go to the stream, and I understand that you've, your streams can get crowded, but you're right there, and right there is the hole, and you go mend, and you mend. Oh, I got to mend again. I got to mend again. I got to mend again. Oh, my God. No wonder you're not catching any fish. Fishing is about mathematics. What you want to do is if that run is over there, go stand over here off to the side, right, and let it rip on an angle. How many times did you have to mend now, right? How many times did you have to pull back on the float now? It's about angles. If your buddy has the exact same rig, the exact same pound test, the exact same bait out of the same container, and he's catching more fish than you, he's got a better angle. How many people have ever measured the depth? Let me see what depth you're fishing. You guys put the floats together. You make sure they all match. Well, the reason why your buddy's catching more fish is he's got a better angle than you. Yeah, this is like some amazing information. Please don't be in denial, folks. You know it is. Yes, sir. Go ahead. I want to get back to this thing. Yes, sir. Uh, are you guys using WD-40 for scent? Yeah, so WD-40 uh, can work. I think, like, so how many people have ever heard of Preparation H? I, I, no, I'm dead serious. As a scent for steelhead. See, this is what's crazy about the Great Lakes. When you go out west to a retail store location, from the floor... As high as you can reach down both sides of the aisle is scent because they get it, right? Their fish are in an ocean. They rely on their nose to find food. Same thing here, man. It's the Great Lakes. It's just a freshwater ocean, right? But for some reason, people in Michigan and Ohio, and people, oh, we can't use that scent. 
Well, that's the, that's the craziest thing I ever heard. Whatever, pal, get the net. I got another one on, right? So preparation H is made with shark liver oil, right? That's why it works. So out west, the fish have been beat on so bad, and all those commercial scents that have been smelt, they use something else that they haven't smelt. Make sense? So, yeah, WD-40 works. A lot of things work, you know, and like garlic, very overlooked. I have a very well-known guide I was fishing with, and I'm on the other side of the boat, and we're fishing spinners because it was early season, and a spinner is a search bait, right, to find the fish. And I cracked open my garlic. He goes, he's like, Roger, what is that? I said, it's garlic, man. Dude, you ain't putting no garlic on your... I said, yes, I am. What do you folks think happened? <laughs> Several times, you know what he said? He's like, can I have some? Can I have some of that garlic, man? <laughs> now, listen, true story. The next time I got on his boat, he had one of those shelving unit things. Attached. The whole thing was scent. The whole thing. So scent does work, right? It's not, the, it's not like the catch-all be-all, right? I'm not trying to tell you that you will catch fish every single time you fish because you use it. That's not what I'm telling you. What I'm telling you is that how can it hurt? How many people have seen the water wolf videos where the, the salmon comes up to the spoon or the fly and they're trolling and they got the camera and all of a sudden they break away? It didn't smell right. That's why meat rigs work so well when trolling for salmon because it smells right. You know what I'm telling you is true. There ain't nobody in this room that's going to disagree with that stuff because it's common sense. All right, anybody else got a question, concern? Yes, sir. Uh, the minnow, I've done it all kinds of different ways. Like I've put it through the lips. I've put it through the head, the eyeball, the tail, uh, you know, the bottom fin, the top fin. I mean, whatever way. It depends on the fish, right? Um, it just depends on the mood of the fish. You know, if I think that if I'm going through that run and I've adjusted the depth, here's another nugget for you. When the bite slows, change color. Bite slows, change color. Bite slows, change your color. But anyways, if, if you're going through the run, you've adjusted your depth, you've tried different offerings of different colors or something, I might get mad dog evil on them and try to do something a little bit different. Right, to make it look as natural as I can. So it just depends. Anybody else? We're good? Okay. Was it okay? Was it a good seminar? All right. So I encourage you to make sure you sign up for the rod giveaway. Um, I don't, do you guys have any more hot dogs or no? They got more hot dogs. And feel free to go out and visit the pro shop. How about a round of applause for Fish USA for putting this on? Great local company, right? Thank you all for coming. God bless you.